So welcome. I'm very, or, very honored to lead a panel on managing in a downturn. And of course, I'm getting very friendly feedback from uh, friends here in Greece who tell me what downturn are you talking about? We are in a bold recovery. So I let them believe that. Uh, and then I get feedback from other friends who tell me, well, it's about a global down downturn. And that's what it is. It's managing in the global downturn. But as you will see, and uh, we will have the opportunity to discuss with uh, very esteemed guests uh, that are in this panel, the questions will be, are we really in a global downturn? What's driving it? And we also want to be very action-oriented. What should governments, what should businesses, what should we do? I'm very honored here today because uh, with me uh, is, uh, first of all, uh, George Hadzinikolaou, who is the chairman of the Athens Stock Exchange and also of Piraeus Bank. And he has been in senior executive positions uh, in a number of global banking institutions. Also, uh, Arub Banerji, who is the regional director for the EU in the World Bank. And Arub is very passionate about social inclusion, but also how technology can be the answer to a lot of the economic and social problems that we have. And he has also been one of the inspirers of social inclusion as a theme for this year's uh, forum. So we are very glad to have him. Then it's Mark Uzan, and I think the think tank that he leads Reinventing Bretton Woods speaks for itself, the very dear institution that held the post-World War II financial architecture that we see being challenged and what we can do about it. And Mark is advising uh, several governments and uh, he has also been a member of the advisory board of central banks. And last but certainly not least is Plutarchos Akelaris, who is not only a professor in the Athens School of Economics, but has been a vice president of the European Investment Bank and also a chair in the Council of Economic Advisors in the Ministry of Finance. So I'm truly honored to be leading this panel. And uh, the idea was how do we interpret the clouds of macroeconomic uncertainty that we see? Of course, we start with Europe, where Germany is really uh, in a borderline technical recession, and it's the biggest economy, so we need to really think about that. I don't know whether we should be concerned, but the panelists will discuss it. Of course, it's very clear that we are entering a period of tighter monetary policy. How tight is the question? And of course, with the biggest economy and very strong exporting economies uh, in Europe, Germany, France, Italy, trade wars matter. Last but not least, what's happening in some of the largest economies, Italy and France. And, still, and the list goes on of the questions about Europe. Then it's the US, where, of course, we can be very positive, because it's 2.9 near the Trump 3% target. So it looks good. But uh, how much fiscal space do we have after the tax reform? And will it last after 2020? That's the big question. Stock markets are doing well. But are they overvalued? Some say yes, some say no, depending on how you look at it. And of course, there is the so-called unknown unknowns, like China. And what the panelists have been telling me, it's maybe it's not going to be the driver, one of the drivers of this downturn, but certainly the driver of the next downturn. And how over-leveraged China is, how much overcapacity there is, are big questions. And of course, the emerging markets with the leverage and also the influence that the big economies have on them. What we definitely know is that the IMF has lowered the uh, global growth forecast and also that global debt is certainly at very high levels. Geopolitics is another big question. Trade wars, Brexit, Donald Trump not being able to control the Fed, but also the judicial system and the Congress and everything else, seeing the Fed's independence being the, the major problem, and Saudi not feeling so much in control of the oil price because geopolitics are really influencing things much more than any cartel. So the way we would like to structure the discussion 
in order to really understand what's going on, but also to come to some solutions, is I would be asking first George Hadzinikolaou to answer whether we are really in a downturn, and if so, what are the drivers, and which economies does he see as being the more vulnerable ones. Then we will go to Arup, focusing on the European economy, and also deep diving a bit more on social inclusion and the role of technology. Then I will turn to Mark Uzan around fiscal and monetary policy coordination and what do we make out of the increased fragmentation that we see uh, in the international financial architecture. And finally, Plutarchos, who will also give us the Greek perspective. I will make the best use of technology with iPhone stopwatch and make sure that your initial statements are six minutes so that we have time for a meaningful discussion. So, George, the floor is yours. If you want, give me all you got, please. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe, maybe it only, I can only control it. Good, okay. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to um, sort of like uh, to talk a little bit where the new, the next downturn will come from. And um, the fact is, it's been over 10 years since we had the last downturn in the uh, major crisis of 2007-8, which was global in scope. So um, since 10 years have gone by, people are wondering uh, when the new recession is coming and whether it's around um, uh, the corner. And in fact, even some speculate that uh, it is around the corner, it's gonna be severe. So being not exactly a mainstream economist, but a, let's say, an economics practitioner, where I need to have a view on the economy, but also I am a participant in the markets, I have taken a stab at this question. And the conclusion which I have come up is, first of all, economists do not die of, of long age, of, um, of aging, of old age. They need something. And I have come here in the slide that you see in front of you with a few uh, reasons where we have seen at least historically, this is a graph that portrays the, uh, at least the US real GDP, which is a proxy because of the size of the US economy for the global GDP. It portrays basically the growth rate of the economies from 1948 to uh, 2018. And I have highlighted below a few of the downturns which have been either industrial shocks, fiscal tightening, monetary tightening, and uh, financial shocks in general. So if I were to go down this list and comment upon it, I would say the, the, the list includes, first of all, long delays and adjustments between the demand and supply. This is a rather outdated concept because we live in a world which is increasingly connected with the global supply chains, with the instant inventory uh, replenishing. And uh, when we basically look at it statistically, you will see that when you look at the volatility of the GDP, again, the US as a proxy for the global GDP, both in inflation and uh, in the growth rate, you will see that volatility has been tamed. So I think most probably we should look elsewhere for that. Uh, if we go down and we look at the uh, monetary policy, uh, the energy, because uh, Vasilis mentioned oil as a possibility, we have seen that either because of the emergence of alternative energy sources, gas is one of them, uh, the use of uh, renewables, we are seeing that the intensity, the ener energy intensity of uh, particularly the US economy, which is again is the bellwether economy, keeps dropping. But most importantly, the US has emerged as a major supplier of energy with the revolution that has taken place there through US fr the fracking with new technologies and the dependence on um, uh, Middle East, which has been traditionally the source of the monopoly which sh shocked the system back in the 70s is much more remote. Um, so if I can really then ask the question, are we close to recession? Statistics and the evidence so far, although we cannot predict the future, 
indicate that most likely not. Uh, the growth rates, as Vasilis mentioned, in the U.S. are robust. And they, although they are slowing modestly, there seems to be enough robustness. In fact, the, the last week, the far, past few days, when the data came out, again, they exceeded expectations. Most probably in the Europe, we can see uh, less robustness for the reasons that Vasilis outlined. And I think our group will really focus on that in the next uh, uh, speech. And if we look also in some of the economic surprises, they also paint a very similar picture. Um, I like, though, to speculate as well on two possible future shocks that may provide unexpected surprises for the global economy. And I will point to two. One is the over leverage of the economy, and the second is the possibility of tightening a little bit more. And the combination of the two is could potentially could be uh, not healthy. Why? Because the over leveraging of the economy means that the capacity of the system to handle higher interest rates is getting lower and lower. And the second uh, uh, possibility, which may lead to uh, potential problems down the road, is the increasing fragmentation of the financial markets. In the aftermath of 2008-9, we have some competition from above. The, uh, the regulation that have followed up has led to an increasing fragmentation in the global liquidity pools. This is dangerous because this combined with increasing capital requirements for the financial institutions who were major participants in the markets and providers of liquidity, this combination can be deadly because we have seen situations where abrupt drops take place in the markets. So for seemingly unrelated reasons, this ephemeral liquidity which is provided in the systems right now through the electronic trading and the, in general, high frequency trading may not be there when we need it. And this can be a cause of instability. Why? Because significant drops in market value in the traded uh, financial assets through the uh, repoing activity can have significant impact on credit expansion and uh, credit uh, uh, contraction in this particular case, which then affects the real economy. This was the story we have seen in 2007-8, and the increasing fragmentation in financial markets may be accelerating this trend and we may surprise us around the corner. So I will, have to, I will stop here. So I will give the opportunity to um, my colleagues to address the other issues. Thank you. Thank you, George. So no concern, <laughs> no concern on the macro, maybe a bit in Europe, but you're saying it's more the financial markets and the fragmentation that we face. Arup, what do you think? Well, um, what I'll try and talk about is actually slightly different, uh, as we discussed, because we talked about the macro and fiscal. We talked about the short term, the immediate. But in a way, if you want to think about the challenge of, uh, of inclusive growth, it's really about the medium term or the long term, and it's about structural policy. So I saw that my colleagues in the panel are not going to be talking about structural a bit, so I thought I would talk a bit about the structural policies um, and the specific shocks that are coming in on the structural. So first, um, in the long run, um, John Maynard Keynes said, of course, that we are all dead. Uh, that may or may not be true. Uh, there are many young people here who may be not dead in the medium term. Uh, what is true for Europe, and that is one of the big drivers of the medium term structural outlook, is that we are all aging. It's just not me, uh, but all of you are, believe it or not, even though you may not think about it while looking in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, that is, think about that, and that is one of the things that I think is often missed in the discourse. What does that mean? It essentially means that there are fewer and fewer people in Europe, and this amount number is decreasing over time. So if you're going to have growth, by simple arithmetic, what you need is fewer people, therefore more productivity per person, right? So that is the medium-term structural challenge. What I want to discuss over the next five minutes or so is where is that source of productivity coming from and what are the effects in Europe right now and globally. So the first thing that I want to do is a bit of audience participation. 
So I would like those of you who have it handy to pull this thing out. All of you have it, right? Pull it out, open to the first uh, screen, and look at the apps that you like the most. Just look at them and think about each app and what sort of job each app has substituted. Right, so what are the apps you use the most, right? Um, well, Uber, some of you, is the obvious one, so you know the jobs that Uber is substituting. But also, think of your calendar app. So right now, how many of you, and I know many, though not all, are using the calendar app yourself to set the appointments that previously somebody else was going to do for you? Uh, think of the camera app and the jobs that that has substituted, because we are taking thousands of pictures most of them on social media, including of puppy dogs and other things, but that's a different matter. Uh, more puppy dog pictures have ha happened because we have this app, rather than if we had to use it uh, in uh, the old-fashioned role. Travel apps, banking. What am I saying? So productivity is increasing because of technology, right? So we, except for the puppy dogs, are more productive. So technology is actually the factor that is helping go against the demographic decline. Half of the audience is using their favorite app, so please <laughs> concentrate here. <laughs> See what a distraction this is? That, that's the productivity goes the other way, but that's a different, different story that we can talk about. <laughs> Don't look at your Facebook feeds yet. Um, the challenge is that this productivity trend, as those of you who were here for Mr. Bar Barroso's session, um, in Europe, <coughs> the digitalization and the productivity increases that are happening, Europe as a whole is falling behind. So the trends that you showed right now, underlying it is a structural uh, stress on productivity. And that's true for Germany, but certainly true for Southern Europe as well, where the digitization that is given rise to the needed productivity is falling behind. A second factor, I'm going to have just two more points. A second factor is that you see, I seem to be telling a really good story, right? So people are aging, but look, there's all this productivity happening. But look outside and look in your experiences. There's a lot of unemployment. There's a lot of underemployment in Greece, but also in Europe. So what's going on? What's going on in a recent book, um, the co-author of which is sitting here, Kristen Bodevik, we, we did called Growing United, which is a book on Europe, showed that essentially what technology is doing is pulling Europe apart in terms of divides. There's a group. <coughs> us <coughs> who are benefiting from technology, who are becoming more and more productive because we are using technology as a complement. And there's a whole other group in Europe and across the world where technology is making them fall further and further behind because they've been substituted by technology. These are the people who are not the people doing the jobs that your apps now do. So that is globally. Uh, a factor that is happening. And let me give you this, only the second quick piece of audience participation. Think of the, why this substitution may be happening. So I want to quote, quote since Vasilis is here, from a study by the Boston Consulting Group uh, for the US, not for Greece. Um, and this is- We're a global firm. You are a global firm, the Boston Consulting Group. <laughs> and um, there's a particular study that looked at welding jobs in the US. So a skilled welder in the US earns, any guesses, how many dollars per hour? Deborah. So um, yes, it's $25 an hour, right? About three years ago, $25 an hour. Now that's a really well-paying job, they're skilled welders. Do you know what a welding robot costs per an hour to operate? $8 an hour. Now, you'd say, but listen, these are very expensive things, right? So substituting the, is not that easy because it will make a massive capital investment. However, the welding robot under US tax laws, you can amortize the capital cost of the entire robot in terms of installation and maintenance in five years. So that brings us to the last point, which is about the business cycle. After all, this is about the business cycle. What is happening, and we are seeing this phenomenon across the business cycle, is that there is a so-called ratchet effect happening in each and every business cycle, where for every downturn, 
the pace of substitution of people by robots is increasing. And why? Essentially what's happening is that when there's a downturn, obviously one of the effects is that people have to be laid off. Right? Workers have to be laid off in many firms. If the firm is going to maintain its level of production and the tax, tax regime allows for that, then they actually use automation to substitute. Um, and then, if that happens, then the jobs are permanently lost. Essentially, for the economists among us, the capital labor ratio has a permanent step change because technology is cheap and the tax policy makes it cheaper. So partly what is happening is that when we go next to the next slowdown, downturn, <clears throat> what may happen is that for the world and for Europe, you may see a change in the way employment structures work, and that has implications that we can talk about later about the possible recovery out of it as well. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Arup. <laughs> very insightful, not only because of the BCG quote, but also <laughs> yeah. because you're saying look not on the macro, but on the micro, productivity, and labor markets. So naturally, Mark, I mean, if it's about reinventing Bretton Woods, you would probably take us a bit more back to macro and the financial system. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, indeed, I'm going to go back to uh, more international macroeconomics and really to try to focus my remarks about what might be the next policy options to fight the next recessions. And my takeaway and my conclusion is that uh, national policy options and international policy options are going to be much more constrained than in the past. And I would try to explain in my short remarks the reason why. If you start to think about monetary policy first, central banks will be able to respond to a deep uh, downturn. Uh, and if you look back at the uh, previous US recessions, uh, past US recessions have been met with 500 basis points or easing by the Fed. With policy rates so low today in so many countries and in so many places, that response will not be available. Central banks will like end up exploring other unconventional measures, and we don't know about their effectiveness, and we ought to be very concerned about what economists call the potency of monetary policy. On the fiscal side, everyday fiscal policy, the room of maneuver has been very narrowing in many countries. Public debt has risen in countries, deficits remain very high to stabilize or reduce debt. Now, to be fair, it will presume that the next slowdown creates a very high unemployment, multiplier will grow larger, restoring some potency for fiscal policy, even we have high level of debt. But we should not expect government today to end up with the ample space to respond to downturn that they have 10 years ago during the global financial crisis. Moreover, with high sovereign debt level, decision to adopt stimulus will be very hard politically. When we look back at the 10 years and the global financial crisis, everyone recalls the public resentment related to you know, endangering the finance of homeowners and small business. So it's going to be very difficult you know, to try not to call and to help relieve the debt burden of these uh, two main agents. So that will create another stretch for public finance. And also, if recessions impair banks, the recourse of bailout will be limited by law following financial G20 regulatory reform that is going to call for bail-in of owners and lenders. So this new system of bail-in remains underfunded and also untested. So clearly we have uh, a new reality. We have uh, limited as a national policy options and we have to think about what I will call the five main challenge that is going to affect the next global town downturn. The first challenge, and I think this is very important because it was you know, clearly uh, here in the corridors, in a lot of conversation, is really China global role. You know, China policy that were inconsequential when China joined the WTO, China GDP was one trillion economy. So whatever China did at that time, you know, the impact of China to the rest of the world were not very important. But now China is globally integrated, is a 13 trillion economy, whose actions have global implications for the rest of the world. And if China is going to continue to benefit from globalization, it will need to focus on how to limit adverse spillovers from its own policy and to invest in making sure that globalization is sustainable. 
if you start to talk about many economists or many experts and you ask them, okay, where's the next financial crisis or the next global shock will happen? Everyone look at China about the high level of debt, the concern about global financial stability. China is a member of the G20. China is, but we don't know how a crisis coming from China will be resolved at the global level. The second challenge is, as we have talked here, that will affect also the downturn is really the issue of trade wars. At this moment, we can call, quote unquote, we have a ceasefires, but we already see you know, the impact of trade pro, you know, protectionism, uh, mainly in the main trading partners, so Germany and other countries. So trade wars is going to be a new normal for the global economy, will clearly affect the next downturn. The number three challenge is clearly when we look back at the global economy, uh, and 10 years ago when we were fighting the global financial crisis, you have a system, and you have a system what we call the global financial safety net. And this global financial safety net helped a lot of countries to raise a crisis because they were able to rely on international institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, bilateral swap, you know, among countries. So all this machinery of international cooperation. What was discussed over the last three days is clearly, are we going to be able to rely on multilateralism where you have one of the major countries who was underpinning about this global, global order is moving away from this order. So we have a global financial crisis. Uh, if you take an example of an emerging market, for example, Turkey or Pakistan at this moment, you know, will we be able, you know, and this is going to be tested, will the US will be able to provide a swap line of dollars what they have done, you know, 10 years ago for countries like Mexico, Brazil, and so on. So we are going to go to an uncharted territory about that, you know, the international policy option might be much more limited than what we have done 10 years ago. So clearly another major challenge, China, you know, uncertainty about how China will play a role. Uh, in a way, we have a, a major global shock coming from China. I might want to remind you, 2015, where the Chinese made a big devaluation and created a major shock for a lot of emerging markets who were major exporter of commodities from China, including Peru, Brazil, and Argentina. So um, uh, my other clearly options is, um, um, sorry, um, China issue of uh, that we might not rely on international financial safety net as we have done in the past, and clearly to make sure that countries don't make any arms at this moment. You see the U.S. has been using fiscal policy where U.S. was still already in a, in a good uh, growth uh, dynamics, but maybe this might be another policy mistake that we are going to be, uh, uh, to be facing with. The last point also is a major challenge that will affect this downturn is clearly emerging market. You know, emerging market have always been dealing with what we call the global financial cycle, receiving a lot of capital inflow, and when something goes wrong, you have a major reversal of capital flow. So everyone was waiting of the normalization of US monetary policy, and this country were already prepared to face with any type of, uh, of a change of US monetary policy stance. So they have to build buffers, to build reserve, but some of these countries were not able to do so. And you have already some flashlight, including Turkey, including Brazil, and you have already uh, Argentina who has been under an IMF program. So the emerging market, you know, and the crisis at the beginning of the 1990s were all emerging market driven crises. We might be going back to another, you know, uh, cycle of emerging market financial crisis. So my concern is, yes, we don't know yet we are going to go to a major downturn uh, at this moment. But I'm worried that maybe the tools that we have at our disposal might not be available for the next downturn. And last but not least, the policy response all over that, what you can see in different circles is called strategic autonomy. As people are more and more concerned about the US you know, being involved, everyone is looking maybe for a new paradigm as the concept of strategic autonomy might be quite relevant for Europe and I will maybe talk later about it. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say I'm a die-hard optimist, but you did it to me. <laughs> but I will drill you on solutions. You know, you won't let us with pessimism. Uh, Plutarche, um, first of all, your perspective would be highly valued, and you've always found the answer on investments, which is what you have always stood for. So, first of all, what's your view? And secondly, is investment going to be the answer? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm not sure that I've always found the answers, but anyway. Uh, so what we have here, as, as was very well described uh, earlier, is uh, 
uh, certainly the oncoming of a downturn, of a slowdown. Uh, and uh, we should all, we all know that no two downturns, slowdowns, economic cycles are the same. So uh, the particular thing I think that about this particular uh, slowdown uh, that we are going to be facing uh, soon, and at some point, of course, there might be uh, a recession, is that there is a new era of uncertainty. And the sources of this uncertainty, uh, to a large extent, have been uh, discussed uh, before, just to, to say a few of these uh, factors, just uh, uh, summarize them and then move on uh, to Greece. Uh, the key thing for me is that you have a persistently, persistently slow productivity growth. And this started before the great financial crisis. And it's affecting uh, certainly the US, and there's a big conundrum there why this is happening. Uh, but also the rest of the develop, uh, developed uh, world, and there's a, there's a big uh, question mark. There's, there's this diminished potential growth, and what does that mean for what we should be doing? And then you have the normalization of monetary policy after the great uh, financial crisis. It's back and forth, but uh, we know that this normalization is going to happen. Third factor of uncertainty is the ongoing deconstruction of the rule-based system, which is going to impact especially on European countries like uh, Germany, but also China and all these other countries that are based on the export-led uh, models. We have the ever-increasing importance of technology. It's been talked about uh, a lot, and it's going to be even more important in when we grow and also when we go down. Uh, we have inequality and the rise of populism. Thank you, <laughs> Stathis Kalivas, for uh, giving us a different uh, aspect uh, of that. And of course, geopolitically, the transition to a bipolar and or maybe even multipolar uh, world. So we have a very different uh, economic field, uh, a very different uh, set of sources of uncertainty that we have to deal with. Now, Greece. What about Greece? Uh, they say that a picture is a thousand uh, words. And I think that the following picture that uh, I press this one um, that I put here, uh, maybe uh, more than a thousand words, so I'm, I'm a, it's a bit too fast uh, to show it yet. I know, <laughs> I know, Taki. I, I originally had it in PowerPoint, so it comes in three stages, but now it came all at once. So what do we have in Greece? We have a different challenge. We have a growth challenge, and we are saying, what downturn? We are growing fast, right? Two percent, two point six percent, two percent this year, maybe. Uh, uh, less, uh, much more than uh, the other uh, economies. But is this really the reality? Is this the reality that uh, we uh, should be uh, facing? And this is where this picture comes in. And this picture is a thousand words because in the average, it shows us our standards of living. Now, it doesn't show, of course, that most of our uh, fellow Greeks have a much worse uh, life than most of us uh, here because this is the average. And a lot of people have been hurt much more by this economic catastrophe, which is called the Greek Depression. So what you see there is the blue line. You have the peak in 2007, and then this uh, amazing uh, depression, which only recently, uh, you see there towards the end of the blue line, 2017, 2018, uh, starting to be reversed. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the 2% growth rates and the 2.6% growth rates. And this is what they are doing to our standards of living. And let's contrast that with the green line. What I've done there in the green line, it's a trend line that shows you a counterfactual scenario of what if there were no crisis. If there were no crisis and we were growing at productivity growth rates that we had between 1973 and 2007, a very long period, and then the projections for population and uh, labor market participation and all that that we have from uh, international institutions, we should be there in the green line. That's if we were to hit the productivity growth rate that we had uh, before. So this is a cause for concern, if not a cause for depression. <laughs> what can what we does do? that mean? What can we do? I think that I'm not going to do, I'm not going to say what we're going to do because this whole forum uh, has been about uh, what we're going to do. And if I were to pick a few things, uh, fixing the NPLs, uh, fixing the uh, civil reform in the civil, uh, civil service, investment, both public uh, and private, reducing the tax burden, it was discussed uh, before, 
uh, earlier. Uh, there are so many things that we need to do, but there is one more important thing in my mind, that we have to be completely fixated at doing that. And just to show you how fixated we have to be at doing that, I give you another scenario, and that's the yellow scenario. And this is my wildest dream scenario about Greece. I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen to Greece, but this is the best that I can think of ever, ever, ever happening to Greece, which is what? Managed to get productivity growth rates the same to be what they were between 1973 and 2007, so much higher than what they have been over the last 10, 15 years. But let's try to do all the right things so that we can hit those. And then, of course, through that, uh, take down the unemployment rate to what it was at the peak, which was around 8.5%, have the population grow at its projection rates, and then what can happen to GDP per capita projection? Then that's the yellow line. And if you cannot see that, I can tell you that that says that with this wild dream scenario, we will be hitting again the peak of 2007 in 2027. And in order to attain this wild dream scenario, we will have to be growing at between 4 and 5% per annum for the next five years. Okay, so I think that these are scenarios, but if we don't get to the job of actually uh, managing this downturn, we are not going to be ever able to achieve this, uh, this scenario. And that means that not even in 2027, can we dream of going back to 2007? And we need to wish all the courage to the upcoming governments to achieve the 4 or 5% growth and growth in jobs. So thank you very much for the different, yet very inspiring perspectives. <clears throat> As I'm trying to jot down notes, I have to say there is two blocks. There is the structural concern on the micro uh, labor, which is Arup. Uh, it's about employment, it's about productivity, which Plutarch has touched upon also uh, for Greece. And I will drill you now on the how. Uh, because, yes, well said, of course, employment, driver of polarization, uh, political instability, etc. How, though? And who has done it that we can learn from in Greece, but also you know, it's not only a Greek problem, the, the structural issues that you are describing, the micro issues, it's touching many countries. Uh, so, Arup, maybe you go first. Thank you very much. Look, the how is, firstly, there is no easy answer, right? If there was a magic bullet, it would be done. But countries in different ways are struggling with how to adjust to this. So let me talk about two things, and we talked about this, Vasilis, one in the short run uh, and in the one, long run. In the long run first. In the long run, it's about education. And that a particular type of education, not number of years. You know, most people in Europe have college degrees, uh, are doing full uh, amounts of education. It's about the quality of education. So the new types of jobs that are required in the economy um, are characterized by one thing. And a simple audience participation question, you don't have to answer, but think about it. How many of you right here are doing today the job that you were trained for in university? Think about that for a minute. Very few. Why? Because you have learned how to learn. And the educational system, you've done it despite many of you, the educational system that you have been through, where the professor sat at, or stood at the beginning, the front of the class, and you repeated everything that uh, he or she said, and you got full marks for that. The system that this very fast-changing technological world is going to demand of our children and grandchildren is an ability to adapt constantly, think critically, and have socialization skills that allow you to avail of this technology as a complement. But again, this is long term. Right. If we think so short right term. Right now, in the short term, you have to then instill this in this, uh, in this way. And that requires a particular focus on training and retraining. And this is done not just by the public sector, though the public sector has a huge role to play but also by private firms who have to take in people and then retrain them for the new world. So let me end, end since there are many employers here, and many industrialists, all of you or many of you are the, in the hiring business. Let me leave you with a thought. How many of you, given the large number of long-term unemployed people in Greece who are there with high levels of skills, how many of you 
when you need to hire, are hiring people who have been long-term unemployed, and how many of you are hiring fresh, bright, young graduates? Just let me leave you with that and think about what that implies and what sort of changes will be needed, not only by the government, but also by the private sector. Thank you. Plutarchia, Joms? Well, I, I think that uh, in the big list of things that uh, we have to do in Greece, I am very much fixated on one thing, which was actually touched upon in the shipping panel uh, earlier, that right now in Greece, the cost of labor is way too high. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, one of the biggest reasons why we have such high unemployment. Yep. And the reason why the cost of labor is uh, high is not so much because of wage, but because of non-wage. So we're talking about pension uh, contributions, most likely, which are really serving as a fiscal device. So I think that on top of all the other things that we have to do in very fast, have to be doing even very fast, even faster, uh, the uh, making uh, hiring labor more attractive. And the, way, the best way to do that is just making it cheaper. And not cheaper by lowering the wage. The biggest part is actually this non-wage component. Thank you. I want to uh, get, leave the last word to the macro financial regulation side. There is, yes, you raised the challenges, George, and you painted a bit of a pessimistic picture about uh, policy coordination, uh, both on the monetary and on the uh, fiscal financial regulation side. I think that although mul multilateralism is challenged, we have stronger institutions uh, than we certainly did when Bretton Woods started. And the question is, can we build on those? Can we improve on those? Maybe, Mark, you can start, and then, George, uh, you can conclude. On institutions, on regulation, on what we have, uh, what can we do in the short term to build on the positive aspects of the global system that we have right now? And well, we have uh, no time, so sure. the, the no, shorter great. the answer, but Quickly, the yeah, maybe if I take the example of Europe, despite uh, yes. sometimes some I think it's a good example. Okay, gloomy assessment about the future of the EU. I but a lot of things was, that have improved absolutely, as well. Absolutely. What was very interesting is despite uh, this gloomy side, you know, we have been building new set of institutions in Europe. Yes. You have the example of the banking union. SSL. You have the uh, European stability mechanism. Who is a de facto a European monetary fund? And what is now very interesting, I think there is something new emerging in Europe and in the Eurozone particularly, that maybe has not been paying attention among, uh, among, uh, among the public, is now, I think, a stronger commitment to make the Euro as an international currency. A recent speech by a major member of the European Central Bank, uh, by the European Commissions, all of these things is coming uh, because they see the concern that the U.S. is using the dollar to weaponize, meaning you know, sanctions against Russia, sanctions against Iran. So more and more, you have this feeling about, OK, we have been creating a, a currency who has, of course, an international dimension, even if it's only 22% of uh, central bank reserve. But maybe we can leverage that more. So I, I see, you know, I don't want to finish in a pessimistic note, but I think that we have been building different track in Europe. And I can clearly see that the international role of the euro is so boost more, the more euro more. If I have absolutely. to sum it up, boost the euro more, yeah. George. Well, in an increasingly interconnected connected world, global cooperation is in one-way street. However, though in practice, and I have been present in a lot of these uh, global fora where you see basically several national organisations come in. The reality is that a lot of these institutions that represent national. Uh, authorities, they really are accountable to the local politicians. And unfortunately, local interests usually are proving to be impediment to this global cooperation. This is the reality. So if you ask me how optimistic I am about this global convergence, I would say to you, I hold a small basket, okay? So you're not so optimistic. So if I have to sum it up, Industrialists rise to the challenge, retrain, hire more, uh, and it's not about well-paid jobs, but it's about more jobs. And then let's build on the good aspects, boost the euro more as a global currency, the um, institutions that have worked, like the banking union, uh, etc., and expand on those. And there is still a note of caution, but I'm living with some optimism and on some actions both on the macro and the micro side. So I'm happy about this panel. I hope you are as well. <laughs> <laughs>